All right, welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 140. Okay, first the news. I want to say I hope everybody had an awesome Passover and a great Easter, whether you celebrate it in the Catholic way or the ancient way, or just hoping that you all had a fantastic day with family and lots of fun. I want to remind everyone on a few fundraisers that are going on right now. So the first is the Scottish Rite Valley of Chicago's Dyslexia Center's Walk for Dyslexia. All the money that we raise goes directly into the charity. The goal is to raise enough funds to open a new facility, train volunteer tutors, and make the difference. Uh, right now, there is over 200,000 people with dyslexia in the Chicago area alone. Our program helps fix dyslexia permanently. Uh, we have a two-year program, which is free to the students which has a 98% success rate. 98%. That's amazing. So please consider sponsoring somebody, uh, giving directly, or perhaps your corporation that you work for wants to do some charitable giving. I know the company that I work for donated, and it was very easy. Uh, They get a little spot on the website and everything. But if you guys go to walkfordyslexia.org, you can see all the options and lots of good information. The second charity I wanted to mention is a new one that I was given the other day, but Again, great cause. It's a new event which is happening in Mount Prospect on June 13th at 9 p.m. The event is called Grotto Fest and is a benefit concert. The cover charge is going to be $8 at the door. The entire cover charge from everybody will benefit the Humanitarian Foundation of the Masonic Grottos of North America, providing dental care for children with special needs. The event will feature three heavy metal bands, Apocrypha, Psychopathic Days, and Children of Dismay. The event is called Death Metal for Dentistry. So if you like heavy metal music and you want to help out, consider going to the event. If you want more information, please email Hiram. 3-5-7 3-5-7 at hotmail.com who is in fact a brother. So again, these are brothers raising funds for the Grotto Fest. Good cause. So speaking of charities, I hope you guys got a chance to watch episode 10 of the Masonic Roundtable. It was all about charity and we talked about some awesome stuff. So if you haven't listened to that, please check it out. We had a great response from the Masonic Me Monday last week. If you didn't follow that piece, go back and check it out. Uh, some really funny stuff on there. Check back on the Midnight Freemasons because we do publish three articles every week and we're also in the biggest independent Masonic magazine in the United States, The Working Tools. So check us out on the web at www.midnightfreemason.blogspot.com or in print by picking up a copy of The Working Tools by visiting www.twtmag.com. That's T-W-T-M-A-G dot com. And I will be doing a follow-up piece to the Masonic Meme Mondays as soon as more memes come out on Reddit and we gather a good grouping of them, maybe in a few weeks. This week is going to be another shorter episode because of the Easter holiday and because I am going on a trip down to the ancient accepted Scottish Rite Valley of St. Louis Southern Masonic Jurisdiction. Uh, If you see me down there, say hello. Anyway, let's dive right into the piece for this week. Dated October 1988, There is No Royal Road to Geometry by Brother Garth Cochran, Calgary Lodge, number 23. Whereas a sound education has become essential to success in all areas of modern society and techniques of education have become increasingly sophisticated, and whereas the aids to instruction such as the many visual and sound equipments now available requires some experience for the proper use, whereas also the craft has so many skilled educators and communicators within its ranks, therefore be it resolved that all Masonic education should be directed by professionally trained specialists in the Grand Lodge research and education committee. Gentlemen, this was to be the topic for debate today. It sounds like it should have been a hot one, but despite the fact that this is a busy time of year, especially for educators, few Masons desired to take on the challenge. Not that I couldn't find Masons with opinions. Almost everyone had an opinion, some very passionate, but None were willing to speak for the affirmative, yet this resolution is worthy of consideration, if only for the process of clarifying one's own thought and creating a rational basis for what, at once, was an emotional response to the question. This resolution is one that, at first blush, sounds worthy of debate. The premise would appear sound. More than ever before in history, an uneducated person is at a great disadvantage. Human progress has assured that. About half of human knowledge has been gained in the 20th century. Simply making a living does not equip one to comprehend or use the knowledge that is now available. 
A Newfoundland fisherman once became very successful by a dint of hard work and willingness to try new things to catch fish. No one on the coast knew as much about where, how, or when to catch fish, or how to dry and treat them so as to get the greatest return from the market. The result was that he soon acquired the means by which to ensure his son would never have to gut and dry a fish to feed his family. He could be sent to university, be educated, and become a man of consequence. The arrangements were made. The son was sent to St. FX, as St. Francis Xavier was known, the grandest college in the Atlantic region. The father was so proud that he bragged to all and sundry about his son and the education he was getting. Then the son returned for Christmas after the first semester. After the greetings and the tears subsided and the rum was poured, the father and son sat in the kitchen to talk. So, me son, tell me what you've been learning at school. Well, father, one of the things I see studying is geometry. Tell me all about it, was the command, for the father wanted to share in the glory of his son's newfound knowledge. But the son knew dad would never understand the complex concepts he was studying at the time, so he decided to start with one of the basics. Well, one of the most basic of all things I've learned is that pi r squared. His father reached over and fetched him a severe clout on the side of the head. Pi r squared? Pi r square, you dolt. I send you to university and you learn that pi r squared. Everybody knows pi is around, cake r squared. The point is, much of the knowledge so accredited over the past century has been technical in nature and as such is available to specialists more than to the public in general. But we must have the various avenues opened unto us at an early age in order to determine the direction we wish to follow for the rest of our lives. Some of us will be fishers, while others will pursue the ultimate geometry. So it would seem that there must be some knowledgeable and accredited person to direct our first steps. If we accept that premise and apply it to masonry as in this resolution, then we must consider how this would be done and whether that would be appropriate. First, the resolution would require that professionally trained specialists are required. Are we talking of educators or communicators or perhaps professionally trained masons? There is no profession of speculative mason and therefore no professionally trained ones who could train the rest of us. But truly, that argument is absurd. The point here is to ask what kind of training would be required? What curriculum would be required of candidates for the post of Masonic educator? How do you decide what a man's qualifications are? For example, in 1969, the Federal Department of Forestry fired all of its tree physiologists. Those at the top decided that they didn't have to know how the tree grew because they knew that they did, in fact, grow. But instead of putting the physiologists to work on silvicultural projects, they let them go, including some of the top experts in the world, because these men had spent their careers to this point studying which foods a tree utilized in order to grow. They weren't allowed to sprinkle different fertilizer formulations on the forest floor to see which promoted tree growth faster. A very good friend of mine, a PhD in tree physiology ended up teaching high school as a result. He wasn't even allowed to do that without going back to the university to get another degree. What can and likely will happen is that we will lose sight of man's masonry in the quest for technical expertise that isn't truly required. There is hardly a man in this room who couldn't, with a few moments of instruction, operate any of the audiovisual equipment or teaching aids referred to in this resolution. Besides being a professionally trained educator, which is how I take the sense of the resolution, would not guarantee that they know how to use such equipment especially the latest class computers. But that's not to say that the skills an educator has in communicating and in teaching are not required. It is simply to point out that professionally trained ones are not the only ones with such skills, nor are they the only ones who can pass such skills on to others. There are many in the craft who are not professional who do this already. The Masonic Spring Workshop is proof of this, as is the work of Fiat Lux Lodge itself. More important requiring professionally trained educators or communicators would remove the right of the mason to serve his craft as best as he can. I am neither a professionally trained educator nor a professionally trained communicator. I am a scientist who became a writer broadcaster because that's what I was interested in. I'm good at my job and I teach people every day, yet I would not qualify for any position on such a Grand Lodge committee as would be required by this resolution. Second, the resolution would require that all Masonic education be directed by such professionals in the Grand Lodge of Research and Education Committee. This carries two implications. 
that the Grand Lodge Committee must develop suitable programs for within the lodges and that it would not only have the power to direct that such programs be used, but that only such programs be used. This would be essential if the committee were to maintain direction of all Masonic education, but this would also create masonry by rote. Sir Josiah Stamp called this process the inculcation of the incomprehensible into the ignorant by the incompetent. Most important, however, directing education from the Grand Lodge Committee would remove individual responsibility for the construction of the moral and Masonic edifice we are all enjoyed to build. For many, if not all of us, the fun would be taken out of the craft. This brings up the third point that the resolution calls upon, all education to be thus directed. That, clearly, is impossible. As Dr. Galen Starr Ross points out, quote, anyone who can read and who owns a dictionary can become an educated person. Hungry minds always become educated and sharpen their mental and emotional tools as they grow in life through experience, end quote. Education is self-directed process, and if we are to build a useful edifice, we must have architectural freedom to pursue our own designs. If it is not on the prescribed curriculum, who is to deny me the freedom to pursue the wisdom of the ancients, the antecedents of a craft, and the philosophical truths upon which masonry and other great systems of belief are based? Who is to deny me the right to pursue the masonry in Mozart's magic flute? Who is to censor my Masonic discussions with my friends? Gentlemen, I believe and the sentiment I found concerning this resolution affirms that it is not that professionally trained people directing all Masonic education ought not to be considered, but that upon consideration it should be soundly rejected. Each of us, including myself, can come up with a thousand good reasons why, and in doing so we help clarify a policy direction for our craft. I wish to pass on to you with the thoughts of Ralph Waldo Emerson on education. Quote, there is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, and that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn comes to him, but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground, which is given to him to till. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what it is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried." End quote. Finally, I gave this talk a little a title based on what Euclid said, because I thought it was appropriate for masons and for masonry. Quote, there is no royal road to geometry. End quote. If we are taught anything as masons, it is that our labor on our edifice is honorable, but it might be our labor chosen of our own free will. The building and even its direction cannot be done for us. There is no royal road, but at the end, we become kings. All right, this week's famous Freemason is Robert Sengstack Abbott. Robert Abbott, born the 24th of November, 1870, and he passed away February 29th, 1940, was an African-American lawyer, newspaper publisher. Abbott is the founder of the Chicago Defender newspaper and the Bud Bilkin Parade and Picnic. Abbott was born on November 24th, 1870 in St. Simmons Island, Georgia although some sources state Savannah, Georgia, from former slave parents. When he was still a baby, his father Thomas Abbott died. Flora Abbott, his mother, then met and married John Sengstack, who had come to Georgia from Germany in 1869. Sengstack's background was remarkable. His father Herman, a wealthy German merchant immigrant, purchased the freedom of a slave woman, Tama, from the auction block in 1847. Subsequently, he married her, and John, their child, had been sent to Germany to be raised there. After returning to the States, John met and married German-speaking Flora. John and Flora raised Abbott in a family with long history of traversing rigid racial boundaries. John was a Congregationalist missionary who wrote, There is but one church, and all who are born of God are members of it. God made a church, man-made denominations. God gave us a holy Bible, disputing men, made different kinds of disciples. Abbott went on and studied the printing trade at Hampton Institute, now Hampton University, from 1892 to 1896. At Hampton, he sang with the Hampton Quartet and traveled extensively. He received a law degree from Kent College of Law in Chicago in 1898. However, due to the racial prejudices, he was unable to practice, despite attempts to establish law offices in Gary, Indiana, Topeka, Kansas, and Chicago, Illinois. In 1905, he founded the Chicago Defender with an additional investment of around $600 to $800 in today's terms. The Defender, which became the most widely circulated black newspaper in the country, came to be known as, quote, America's black newspaper and made 
Ab Abbott, one of the first self-made millionaires of African-American descent. The unique circumstances of the early 1900s created the environment in which the Chicago Defender became successful. Tensions were building in the years surrounding World War I. Blacks were migrating from the South to the industrial centers of the North, which were in great need of workers to manufacture goods for the war. Also, stories from previous migrants to the North were trickling down. Writings in the Chicago Defender captured those were trickling down to the South and giving hope to the people. Sengstack, through his writings in the Chicago Defender, captured those stories and encouraged people people to leave the South for the North. In fact, he even set a date, May 15, 1917, for the Great Northern Drive, a name he coined for the event to occur. In his weekly, he showed pictures of Chicago and gave plenty of space for classifieds for housing. In addition, Abbott wrote about how awful a place the South was to live in comparison to the idealistic North. Abbott's words described the North as a place of prosperity and justice. This persuasive writing thereby gave this journal probably the greatest stimulus that the migration ever had. Sengstack was a fighter, a defender of rights, and he created a list of nine goals that constituted the Defender's Bible. 1. American race prejudice must be destroyed. 2. The opening of all trade unions to blacks as well as whites. 3. Representation in the President's Cabinet. 4. Engineers, firemen, and conductors on all American railroads and all jobs in the government. 5. Representation in all departments of the police forces over the entire United States. 6. Government schools open to all American citizens in preference to foreigners. 7. Motormen and conductors on surface, elevated, and motor bus lines throughout America. 8. Federal legislation to abolish lynching, and nine, full enfranchisement of all American citizens. In his final years, in 1919, Illinois Governor Frank Loden appointed Abbott to the Race Relations Commission. The commission would go on to publish the book *The Negro in Chicago*. Though some of Sengstack's family became, though some of Sengstack's family became Nazis, Abbott continued correspondence and economic aid to those that accepted his family's history and also assisted the owners of his birth father the descendants of Captain Charles Stevens, whom Abbott was able to assist during the Depression, even to paying for the education of the children. Abbott died of Brighton's disease in 1940 in Chicago, Illinois. He was buried at Lincoln Cemetery in Blue Island, Illinois. His will left the newspaper in control of his nephew, John Henry Sengstack. His home, the Robert S. Abbott House, became a national historic landmark. He was indeed a famous Prince Hall brother. Just an incredible individual and you gotta be glad to call this guy a brother, right? Because even the animosity felt at those times, he helped out his birth father's quote-unquote owners in the Depression. Something, I think, exemplifies Freemasonry. Just blind giving. He didn't care. It's just an incredible story. That's it for this week. Remember to support the show. Please check out www.wcypodcast.com, which is, of course, our website. Click the links for supporting the show and check out all the ways that you can help, either by getting our app for your mobile device, shopping at Onnit or freemasonryart.com, and using the promo code WCY at checkout, which, by the way, gives you 10% off, or even if you do a direct donation through PayPal. All of these help us immensely. And Brother Queensberry, yet again, thank you for your continued support. Please find us on Facebook and give us a like, share us with your friends. Check us out on Twitter at Whence Came You. We're on Google Plus at the email address wcypodcast at gmail.com. You can email us at that same address. We're on Tumblr, MySpace, Pinterest, iTunes, uh, the Blackberry Rim Player, Stitcher Smart Radio, you name it, and we're there pushing out content for today's Freemasons. Thanks for listening, everybody. Stay on the level. And until next week, for Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson.